Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Offshore Wind Works Grant Solicitation Overview webinar. Um, very happy to have you all here. We are going to be recording this meeting. You just got that little notification, um, and we'll be posting the recording to our Offshore Wind Works website so that anyone who couldn't attend today can still um, hear more about our solicitation. And um, things are a little different this time around, so we have a little bit of a different format and structure to our solicitation, which we'll be talking about in kind of the second half of our presentation today. Um, but just to start off, I will introduce myself. I'm Lauren Farnsworth. I work on the Mass DEC Offshore Wind Team as a Senior Program Manager and oversee this um, Offshore Wind Works program. And I'm Jeremy Belknap, a Program Coordinator on the Offshore Wind Team at Mass CEC. Excellent. So we will get started. So just a quick um, overview of our agenda for today, for the hour that we'll be together. Um, we're going to kind of dive into a Mass CEC overview and then more on our Offshore Wind Team and kind of what we do in our team and what we're looking to support. We'll talk to you about our workforce development strategy, some of the research behind um, that inform our solicitation, and some of our past awards as well. We'll talk about our Offshore Wind Works community of practice, which is kind of our growing network of awardees in the state. And then the most important part of today is that we will talk about our sixth round of the Offshore Wind Works grant opportunity. Um, and we'll talk about our focus areas and the three distinct tracks that we have um, for this option. We do want to encourage everyone to please use the Q&A tool that's part of this webinar. You can add your questions in at any point during the webinar whenever they come to you, um, and then we will be getting to those probably the last five or ten minutes of our webinar today. So please do use that tool. Okay, so just to start, we'll do a very brief overview of Mass CEC for those of you who aren't familiar with us. We are a um, quasi-public agency in Massachusetts, and we are here really to help the state meet its climate goals and to support clean energy. Um, so these are kind of our four major focus areas. Of course, offshore wind, that's kind of what we're all here to do and talk about today. Um, but we also have teams that are working on modernizing our grid infrastructure, helping um, high performance buildings and getting those up to code for um, more of more of a carbon free environment and then clean transportation as well, electric vehicles and public transportation and things like that across all of these four focus areas. Um, we have a strong commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. We have an entire team outside of um, what Jeremy and I do that work on workforce development across all clean energy sectors. Um, we also invest in um, technology and early stage startups. So that's Mass CEC at a glance. Great. Um, so our offshore wind program, what do we do on our team? Um, we like to sort of break this up into three different pillars. Um, the first being planning analysis and engagement. We are part of many different technical working groups all around offshore wind, whether it be research and innovation, wildlife or marine mammals. Mass CEC is either convening those groups, has started them up, or is a part of them. Um, so that's a big part of what we do. A lot of what we'll be talking about today falls under sector development. So that is really growing um, the workforce and the supply chain in the state. A lot of that has to also do with our um, ports redevelopment work. Um, and we also do own the port site in New Bedford, the Marine Commerce Terminal, uh, which is currently the location that the Vineyard Win One project is working out of. And that's been very exciting to be able to see firsthand. Um, and lastly, research and innovation. Our colleague Nils Bolgen um, works in this area. And it's really exciting and interesting to be able to work with academia um, and kind of help support some of this innovation in offshore wind so that we can reach our goals in the state. That's what we do on our team. 
<clears throat> so now we'd like to sort of focus in more so on offshore wind and workforce development strategy. So we kind of take this a full round approach to developing our workforce in the state. Um, a lot of it really needs to be first um, researched so that we can better understand and we can inform our grant pro programs. Um, so we have conducted a slew now of different, um, different research um, reports, whether that be specific to workforce or it could be supply chain that also sort of goes hand in hand. We'll talk about some of those reports kind of further down the line here today. Uh, but that's kind of the first step in our strategy. We're also very engaged with industry. Um, we work closely with developers and some of their contractors um, on the projects that here in Massachusetts so that we better understand the needs of the industry, um, which also helps us you know, align partnerships um, and help folks connect. So we're really good at making those connections for people. Of course, we're investing um, in resources and we're trying to fill needs and gaps. We're supporting these programs and we're also convening groups. So one of the, the big things that we'll talk about today is our Offshore Wind Works community of practice, which has really grown over the years. So we started this grant program in 2017, um, and now we have over 20 different organizations um, that have been, that have received grants through our program. And we're all working kind of toward a similar and same goal in the state. So it only makes sense for us now to convene, get together and, and share, you know, what we're working on and what those challenges might be. So some of you might be familiar um, with Offshore Wind and some of you less so. So I figured it would be important just to kind of stick this slide in here. Um, but what really are the job opportunities? It's kind of, I think, easiest to look at them within the stages of uh, an offshore wind project and the, the life of a project. So up at the kind of pre-planning and development stages leading up to the construction of an offshore wind farm, Jobs there are likely um, going to require a four-year degree, um, most likely in engineering, could be in planning or permitting. Um, you might have a law degree, you can help with contracts, but um, typically the jobs leading up to construction will require some sort of higher education. Uh, once you get into manufacturing and assembling options, it sort of opens up uh, more broadly. This also represents the largest amount of possibility for job growth um, in the nation. So the more that we bring um, domestic manufacturing facilities here to the state, the more um, job opportunities there will be. We're seeing some of that here in Massachusetts um, with the uh, Prismian cable plant opening in Somerset and the job opportunities that will come along with that. The next phase of the project, of course, construction, installation, um, that's sort of what's going on right now in our backyard um, in New Bedford and out in the water near the vineyard. So there's certainly a lot of folks engaged in the project at this stage, um, likely engineers, skilled labor, um, project managers, folks that have a background and expertise in any kind of maritime activity, especially captains. Um, this is definitely a good fit for you there. And then the last sort of stage in the long life of the um, project is really the operations and maintenance. This where, is where your um, turbine technicians who are kind of do, going out and doing routine repairs and maintenance would fall under, folks that are maintaining the cables um, and the foundations. So that's sort of a 25 to 30 year um, job opportunity commitment there. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a background and overview. This next slide um, is to show you some of the research that we've been doing on our team to help inform how we write up our solicitation. It does change every year, um, and those focus areas change based on need. So not only are we understanding need from industry engagement, but also through some of these assessments. So MassDEC, actually on the, the workforce development team, so outside of offshore wind, um, looking across all clean energy sectors, 
has conducted this um, clean energy workforce needs assessment. So that came out um, just a few months ago this year and has been really um, informing us on the job growth by 2030 to get us to some of these clean um, energy goals that we have in Massachusetts. And so you can see here through some of the highlights that um, there is certainly a large amount of um, job growth in offshore wind. And a lot of that is because there's, you know, it, it's a new industry. So it's starting from very small numbers and growing from there. But there are certainly a lot of crossover between um, the high growth occupations across clean, clean energy sectors. So, of course, electricians is a big one assemblers and fabricators, and a lot of this does fall under um, manufacturing work that I mentioned earlier. Um, we had also conducted a few other workforce development um, reports, the one in 2021, one in 2018, um, and those really helped, like I said, inform our solicitations, but also some um, of the information we used on our website. We have a career pathways tool, um, and that sort of helped um, helped us get that together. Um, because we now have this community of practice group, we thought it would make a lot of sense to um, get a little bit of feedback from that group. So we've got two different assessments from our community of practice that our wonderful facilitators have helped us with, Rebecca Lashman Consulting Group. Um, and so what they did is they kind of assessed our portfolio of awards to date, so from 2017 on and gave us some feedback about where we need to kind of focus our efforts. Um, and we'll talk about some of that feedback later on in today's presentation. Great, so where have we been making investments in the Offshore Wind Works program? This is a pretty good list um, and kind of categorizes all the projects to date. So we have a few different programs that are working on introductory offshore wind courses and programs. Um, this is very important as it is a new industry. So not only do we need to teach folks a little bit of background about what offshore energy or offshore wind energy is and um, kind of the processes that are involved, we also need to really get the word out and spread awareness about job opportunities. Um, and so we're we're looking to really focus in on um, kind of early childhood education through high school um, and certainly a focus on career and technical education as well. Um, health and safety training programs. It's likely that a lot of you are very familiar with GWO. Um, we have supported a number of training institutions that have stood up these GWO um, safety training programs as well as technical training programs. Um, we do have a, a few programs with um, some of the skilled labor and the local unions in Massachusetts um, that have been such a vital and important part of the project. We're also supporting, <clears throat> excuse me, some undergraduate and graduate programs that are helping folks kind of at a professional level um, to better understand the industry and sort of where they fit and where they would like to, um, to join in the career path. And then, of course, training infrastructure. This is sort of a newer focus area for us and something that we're continuing to support with this new round of funding. Um, but we have supported training um, virtual simulators as well as actual facilities to stand up training. Um, so any kind of specialized equipment needed in those facilities that can really help um, with this really specialized kind of training. And then one of the biggest um, kind of focus areas we have seen and we continue to support and emphasize in our program is access to opportunity. So this was taken from the name of our 2021 solicitation where we entirely focused on just expanding access to opportunity in the offshore wind workforce. Um, we kind of moved away from industry needs and looking at, um, you know, some of those focus areas I'd mentioned earlier and really honing in on, on this because we had asked, um, you know, we had solicited the similar um, idea in the past, but really weren't getting anything substantial back as far as proposals went. And I think when we kind of focused our efforts entirely 
it shifted perspective a bit and people understood um, the importance of, of diversifying our workforce and really expanding out awareness. Um, and so this is something that we're continuing to do and continue to support in our next round as well. Um, but a lot of this is, is providing wraparound services and making sure folks can um, you know, equally get to a job opportunity if needed. So here is a little bit of an overview of the awards we've made to date. Um, th these are just some of the logos of the awards. We don't have all 24 up there, um, but you can see we've invested quite a bit over these rounds um, and we've made 43 total awards to date. So this is kind of our community of practice group, which is growing. <clears throat> we can see on the next slide here, a nice example of um, one of our community practice meetings, we typically try to hold them at some of our grantees um, facilities and locations if we can. And we were very lucky this day to join uh, Mike Burns on the Mass Maritime campus. Um, and he's there giving us an overview of, of what's at the dock there. Um, but really what we're doing is we're getting feedback from the group understanding what topics they'd like to cover in our convenings, understand what challenges they're facing, understand what's working for them and um, if they could share out with that. Um, so like I said earlier, we had done a few assessments of the group and we're using that feedback to kind of drive the topics um, and planning for each one of these meetings. We're doing half of them remotely, half of them in person, which has worked out really well. I think it's also really helpful um, with partnering on future grant opportunities. So that's something we're hoping to continue to facilitate. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> now we're going to get into sort of the second half of our presentation here. And I really want to um, inform folks about our new solicitation. It is a little different, as I mentioned. We have three distinct tracks this time. And the reason for that is because we have three distinct funding sources. So our first track is going to, I'll dive into this in a minute, but it's going to be kind of the, the typical workforce development programming you've seen from MassDC under this program in the past. Um, the other two sources are a little different and have some different requirements. So that's why we're kind of splitting it up into three tracks. Um, folks could apply to all three. That is um, totally an option, but you would need to submit three separate proposals, um, which would be three separate application forms. So I just want to make that clear as to why they're kind of separated and, and what you could do with it. So we'll go ahead and dive into track one here in the next slide. So, um, we have three different types of projects you could uh, propose under track one. And this is in keeping with what we had last year. So we've got um, a workforce development and training project. We like to keep this somewhat broad um, because we do have specific focus areas that we're looking to solicit um, projects from, but we are open to other ideas if folks have them. So. An example could be developing curriculum for an offshore wind module at a CTE school um, to help with awareness and, and build up the career pipeline. Um, we also have the opportunity to do an access to opportunity project. So I've already sort of talked about that one and, and dove in. The example here says a pre-apprenticeship or pre-training pre program that fills existing gaps. Um, we have listed in our solicitation what some of those gaps might be. We've got a lot of resources at MassDC as far as the workforce needs assessment goes um, and others that would really um, help, I think, guide a lot of the programs you're developing. Um, and lastly, the, other, the third type of project you could propose is a workforce study. So that's a little different, um, but we are open to supporting a study that would help us and others um, better understand offshore wind workforce development. So if that's maybe focusing in on safety concerns or if that's focusing in on best practices for recruitment of folks, um, that's something that we wanna learn from and share with others. <clears throat> Great. 
So some of the focus areas for track one, um, skilled trades, career and technical education, I had talked about that earlier, secondary and higher education, and worker safety. Um, I should mention access to opportunity, diversity, equity, inclusion is a focus area, and we kind of talk about that at the bottom because it goes across all three of these tracks, but that is one of our um, criteria as we evaluate proposals. That's something we'll be looking for. Okay, so track two. Um, now, this funding source is um, from ARPA, so the American Recovery Plan. So these are federal dollars, um, and they do have pretty specific um, project timelines and spending and reporting requirements. Um, we'll get into that, but just up front, this is really to support any kind of training infrastructure. So that could be very specialized um, equipment for training. It could be a facility that would house a training facility for offshore wind specific to safety technical training or other. Um, and an example might be renovation, upgrade, or um, modification of existing buildings, procurement, installation, commissioning of electronic training systems, vessel operations, simulators, virtual reality systems systems, excuse me. Um, but yeah, that is the second track. Like I mentioned, it does have some specific requirements um, that we can go to in the next slide. Great. Um, so for this project, um, contracts need to be finalized in December 2024. So that means everything needs to be totally signed off on, on both ends and uh, we have a contract in place. And then from that date, you have exactly two years to work on the project. So there's really no room for extensions um, and all the funds must be expended by December 2026 or else the federal government takes the funding back, which we don't wanna do. Um, so we're just, you know, putting all that information up front to make sure that that would align with the project you have in mind for infrastructure. Um, and of course, there are going to be some kind of specialty reporting requirements. Um, these, basically, you'd have to do some sort of quarterly um, reporting. So we would ask you for some metrics, demographics, and information. There is an example agreement we'd also ask you to take a look at. It's in some of the attachments of our solicitation, um, and you should look through that to see the differences um, and make sure that you've reviewed that and provided feedback to us that this is a track that you're applying to. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the information on that one. Great. So track three is a, um, a very exciting um, collaborative effort. So this one is actually sponsored by Vineyard Wind. So this is very much a need that they are seeing on their project and would like to help support um, as we continue to build out some of these projects in the future in Massachusetts. So this funding is um, specific to training the port workforce. So we want to cover many scopes. Um, it's not specific to just one kind of effort on the port, um, but it could be things like standardizing health, safety, um, environmental training. It could be the uh, crane operating or standardized signaling training. Um, it could be any sort of required training for the port workforce. It could also be um, stevedoring operations. And, and companies that would help with that training themselves. So really kind of um, an effort to help the port workforce grow with offshore wind um, and, and get ready for this new industry. Because as we know and can see from the photo here that I think Jeremy took, um, these components are very large and they do require very specialized um, and skilled folks to work around the port and lifting them and moving them properly and getting everyone um, safely on the project. So that is kind of the third track we have. 
as I mentioned, the funding source is Vineyard Wind for this one, and we're kind of working together as part of their um, accelerator funding project that we oversee at MassDEC um, to be eligible for um, for track three. You must have you must be a company that has experience and capabilities working within a port already. So you're not new to this world. Um, you have been a part of other port activities, maybe in a different industry other than offshore wind, which is totally fine. But you certainly do have that background and our operational competency kind of related to all those activities we talked about, like stevedoring, rig rigging, signaling, line handling, vessel loading and offloading. Um, we will be prioritizing Massachusetts-based stevedoring um, and, and port companies. We will also um, sort of acknowledge that there are no hard lines between states here and that there is certainly um, a commute for the workforce. So we will certainly, um, you know, as I said, give priority to Massachusetts companies, but we'll look um, in a regional basis as well. Great. And so um, we've kind of given you the specifics on each track, um, but there is a lot of detail that goes and cuts across all three of these um, tracks. So what is expected of you as far as a cost share? So MassDEC does like to see that our dollars are going a little bit further. Um, and so we do have a requirement for cost share. Um, for private entities, we typically require a one-to-one -one, um, match, which you can see on this table here um, is required for track one and track two projects. We aren't requiring it for track three, um, but do keep in mind that that is um, something that we'll be considering as we evaluate proposals. It is always nice to see that, like I mentioned, the dollars are being leveraged and going a little bit further. Um, so that's something that we definitely consider as far as ranking of proposals, but it won't be a requirement. Um, for public entities, we like to see a 25% match, um, so a little bit lower than a private entity. We also have language in our excuse me our solicitation um, to state that if you can't reach that minimum requirement, um, we are open to hearing what you can do and how we can sort of help you get there, whether that be through some partnerships, um, in-kind labor or other. Um, so we, we do have a little bit of flexibility there, but typically we do require a, a minimum of the 25% cost share. Um, you can see the available funding. Oh, sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> I didn't mention the first row yet. Um, the available funding for the three tracks does differ. So for track one, that was kind of the traditional workforce development program, we would like to make awards up to $2 million. Um, and then track two, we have available, I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly, <laughs> not awards up to $2 million. We have available funding, $2 million. Um, all of these uh, tracks add up to $8 million, which is the total funding we have available um, for all three tracks. Sorry about that. Track two, we have $5 million available for the ARPA funding, the infrastructure, and then track three, we have a $1 million total for the Port Workforce Initiative. <clears throat> uh, we had someone ask uh, in the Q&A what the funding source was for track one, and I'll just say that that's our, our typical Mass EEC uh, budget, offshore wind budget. That's what's been um, approved by our board, um, so not an external funding source there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's exciting because that would be, you know, what we'd be able to spend this year on our um, kind of offshore wind work program, and this year we can go a little bit further because we have these outside sources, which is great. Um, so a note here on the priority groups that we're looking to focus in on our efforts here and, and to be the folks that we're targeting when we're developing, expanding, or growing some of these training programs. Um, we have identified four different um, priority groups. So we have individuals that reside in EJ communities or low-income communities. 
Um, if you want to learn more about that and actually pull up a map and understand um, what this means, you can use that little um, code there, that QR code, and it'll bring you up to the website to find out more information. Um, we're also prioritizing members of federally recognized or state acknowledged tribes, members of underrepresented communities in the offshore wind workforce, or current or former workers from the fossil fuel industry. So um, we do have language in our solicitation that tells you, um, of course, this is kind of a major area of focus for us. We will it is one of our um, heavily weighted parameters for evaluation as we look at proposals. We want to make sure that you're taking the time to understand who these pr prospective employees are, um, kind of what the barriers to entry into the, the workforce might be. We have a lot of information we provide in attachments and have links to. So we really like to see that folks are doing some of the homework and understanding um, how we can be really equitable um, in, in rolling out this new industry. So the next slide here, project design. Um, this was um, actually, some of this feedback came from our offshore wind work community of practice assessment. And so when Rebecca Lashman Consulting um, was looking at our awards, they did give us some feedback to tell us where to really focus in our efforts. Um, so in, in terms of project design and what we're looking for in proposals, um, it's really important to consider geographic location, also to consider um, where your priority groups or your target audience are commuting from. Um, we are looking, you know, right now we have a lot of projects rolling out on the south coast of Massachusetts, which makes a ton of sense um, based on where the projects currently are. We're also looking up on the north shore of Massachusetts and Salem in particular, um, as far as, you know, the development of the wind port there. So certainly important not to limit our programs to only certain regions and kind of make them a little bit broader for folks. Um, we very much prioritize partnerships when we're looking at proposals. We really like to see that folks are doing the work to engage with the industry and kind of understand the needs. We have some great examples <clears throat> of folks in the past who have worked together. Um, we actually just wrapped up a project with IBEW, the electricians, um, local union 223, who had partnered with JDR Cable who are a cable manufacturer and provider um, on the Vineyard Wind Project, and they did some high voltage training. Um, so that's a great example of partnering. Um, and it doesn't have to be directly with, um, you know, a contractor or provider on the project. It could be with an, a community-based organization that very much understands um, the folks, you know, that are living and working in their area and could help you and, and bring something to the table with your proposal. Um, and we are very happy to help kind of make those connections. So what we're doing, and I'll talk about this a little further down the line, um, but on our website, we will have a um, kind of an Excel sheet where if you would like to be listed as a potential partner, we can add your information there so that others see it um, and they can reach out directly to you. And anyone who wants to be listed there, it's kind of a great way just to get yourselves out there, get yourselves known, um, and we'll be kind of providing just the platform to do that. We definitely um, love to see partnerships. Um, as I mentioned, DEIJ elements strongly encourage. Um, we like to see that folks have really identified a priority group. They've identified why they're targeting this priority group and how their organization or training provider um, has either a history of working with this priority group or is partnering with someone who can um, and has that history. So that's something really important um, that we'll be looking for in proposals. <clears throat> so selection criteria. This is taken um, straight from our 
solicitation. And this gives you an idea of how Jeremy and I will pick out our score sheets and what we'll be looking at, what we'll be kind of ranking and rating as we look at all the proposals. So of course the program summary and scope does it actually, you know, address some of the um, focus areas that we had outlined? Does it address a need for the industry? Does it respond to kind of what we have outlined in our solicitation and other assessments that have been put out there? Um, we really want to make sure that what you're proposing um, does have some sort of outcome on the other end of it, whether that be, you know, you're you're looking to engage with a certain number of folks in a community and educate a certain number of folks as to what offshore wind is, or whether it means you are going to work with an employer partner to bring on 10 new hires or something like that within a year. Um, so we really want to see that you're putting in the effort to address some of the needs that we've identified. Team experience and qualifications. Um, of course, that makes a, lot, a big difference, um, whether folks on the team, the applicant team, um, have experience in kind of what you're proposing. We also, um, we don't require them, but we'll take letters of support um, to show that either partner organizations um, are in their background and they're qualified kind of to be a part of the plan is really helpful for us to better understand what you're proposing. Um, but that's certainly something that we look at. The work plan. So we like to see pretty detailed work plans. Um, we like to really understand kind of looking at a timeline over the course of two years, which is pretty typical on average for a lot of the programs that we support through this program, that you've got a clear plan from start point to end point of the goals um, and the steps that you're going to take to achieve those goals. Um, so we do actually include, if you've looked at our solicitation already, you've probably seen that there's a table in there um, where we, we have you actually fill in your milestones um, along the way. And we like to see a lot of information just so we can really understand um, in detail what you'll be doing over the course of the project. Commitments to DEIJ and or priority groups. Um, we want to make sure you've got kind of a genuine commitment um, to this to this group that you're um, targeting your proposal to. And we want to make sure, like I mentioned earlier, that your organization or partner organization has the capacity to do so and um, has the experience to do so as well. The budget. Um, we want to, first of all, make sure it comes within um, what we've outlined in our solicitation for a, um, a total cost of a project. Um, we also want to make sure that what you've sent us makes sense and that we can kind of see through the line items you've listed um, that everything's accounted for and that you've also identified um, <clears throat> sources of your required cost share commitments. Value demonstration, um, what we do is typically we'll kind of rank the proposals as one batch um, and see how they kind of um, compare, I guess you could say, to other proposals and, and looking at what the needs are that we've outlined in the solicitation and making sure that we've got kind of good competition there. This year, and I'll talk about this in the next few slides, we are extending our due date a bit, which is great, I think, for folks. Um, what we're going to do is have kind of two due dates, actually. And so we'll review the proposals in two batches. And that way we can um, look at the value demonstration within those two groupings that we'll get in. Awesome. So application materials. There are a lot of um, attachments for this solicitation in particular because we have the three different funding sources and because we have a lot of different requirements this time around. Um, I mentioned earlier there is a sample agreement in there, so there's a sample contract. Um, we very much like for you and your team to look at that sample contract and provide us back um, really any feedback, concerns, questions you might have, even proposed language 
it just helps the um, process down the line a bit. Um, also, we have a signature and acceptance form, so that's a requirement. And then the application form, which is the most important piece of your proposal. So that's where you're going to be telling us the name of your project. You're going to be telling us what organizations are involved, if there's a partner, what your total budget is, and then you'll be kind of giving us an elevator pitch at the beginning, um, kind of a summarized short plan. Um, and then you'll go into further detail with milestones and deliverables. Um, yeah, so that's an important part. Like I mentioned earlier, each track has its own specific um, application form. So I did mention that your team could possibly apply to more than one track if you like, but please make sure you submit separate application forms. Um, oh, sorry, Jeremy, can you go back? <laughs> so optional attachments, I talked about this just um, a few minutes ago, but letters of support, we always like to see those. It just kind of strengthens your commitment with a partner that you might have on board or others who are going to be helping or consulting on the project. So it does mean a lot. We don't necessarily require them, but just keep that in mind um, as you're kind of forming ideas and partnerships. Um, there is a self-assessment tool, and we add a link to it in our solicitation by the Supplier Diversity Office in um, Massachusetts. So if you um, take that self-assessment, you can better understand if you qualify as either a diverse vendor, business, and MWBE. Um, it's also helpful just to understand what those um, titles actually mean and whether some of the programs or organizations you'll be working with might fall under um, some of those categories. And then the DEIJ materials. Um, actually, Jeremy, what is that specifically? I'm not sure. We just ask for supplemental materials if they want to include, you know, their their organization wide DEI statement or stuff like that. Right. Example right. So there's of previous projects. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and then submission requirements. So we ask that everyone submit their application forms with their attachments and sample agreements all to our offshore wind account by five o'clock on the due date. Like I said. Earlier, there are two due dates. We'll go into that on the next slide. Um, but really important to add that um, exact title into the subject line. That way we can make sure we're not missing any applications as they come in. Um, very important is that the proposals you send in on the application form be very descriptive but concise. Um, we do read a lot of these proposals and we try to get through them as quickly as possible so we can have a turnaround time and uh, make sure folks are aware of whether they've been awarded or not. Um, and to help us with that, it's really good to sort of just stick to exactly what we're asking for. I know folks work really hard on these proposals um, and just want to make sure that you understand it's, it's best for us to understand the detail, but in a concise manner, you could say. <clears throat> I'll also add before we move on, if you do end sure. up applying to multiple tracks, say a track one project and a track two project, separate those materials out, send two separate emails. Um, and so that way we can kind of keep track of separate proposals as they come in. Great. Okay, so here is the timeline. Um, so a little different this year, as I mentioned, we have released our solicitation November 14th. Today's our webinar. Um, in the past, we've had a kind of two-week Q&A period where we ask people to submit their questions in writing by email to us, and then by a certain date, we would post them all online. Because we have a longer um, application period, we've decided to just keep the Q&A period um, open, ongoing throughout the entire process. So if you do have a question as you're um, kind of building up your proposal, you can submit that to us by email, and we will periodically just update our responses on our website. So it's all, all going to be public so that everyone can see the question and the answer. We, of course, are going to, you know, we would not put the organization that asked the question listed there. Um, just 
we'll post it anonymously, but um, we want to make sure everyone's getting the same information. Um, so the first batch of proposals will be due February 2nd of next year, 24. It's coming up quick. Um, and then the second batch will be due in April, 20, um, end of April, the 26th. We plan to notify folks of awards in the first batch by March and the second batch by June. And then we'll sort of be doing the contracting process throughout. Um, the hope is that we can get going right away on contracting with the first batch before we've even awarded the second batch. So hopefully that'll speed up the process a bit as well. Um, like I mentioned, we recorded this webinar today. We're going to be posting it to our website. All the questions can be submitted to the offshore wind account um, and we'll be posting those on our page. Um, what else is important to mention here? Oh, track two proposals. So those are the ARPA funds for infrastructure. They're encouraged um, to be submitted in the earlier batch. So the one that's due in February 2nd. The reason for that is we have to be totally under contract by December 24. Um, and just to make things a little bit more secure and make sure we're not hitting that timeline too closely or tightly, um, we'd really like to see those items um, proposed in this first round. So if, that, if that's something you're thinking of, um, I would really encourage you to do that. We have a limited number of, of we have a limited you know batch of funding for that category. So um, we can only really award in the second round what's left after the first ones are awarded. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about the um, infrastructure piece. Great, so I sort of mentioned this already, but we really want to encourage and facilitate partnerships. Um, we have seen tremendous partnerships in the past throughout our program. I think folks are um, really engaging with each other, especially through our community of practice. And now that we have this kind of ecosystem in Massachusetts of training providers and educational institutions, um, they're really coming together and we're seeing it more and more each year with proposals, um, which is great. So if you're interested in um, being on this kind of publicly posted spreadsheet, please reach out to us, um, send us an email, give us the name of your organization, um, what type of organization you are. Are you a nonprofit, a community-based organization, a private company? Um, your name and email, and then maybe even a target sector. So which um, which uh, track are you looking to propose? Which focus area are you looking to address? Um, any of that information is really useful for folks that are looking to partner. Okay, great. So we're at the end of our presentation now. So I think we'll go over to some of the questions. I do wanna mention that typically we really like to see questions in writing. That way we can kind of make sure our entire team is on board and that we can post them publicly so that others have a chance to see the information as well. Um, I'll try to answer questions to the best of my ability today. Um, but I would say, you know, for a really um, official answer, you would want to submit that same one in writing um, to make sure you have our word on it and it's sort of approved by everyone on the team. Um, but All yeah, right. so please, should we into questions? Yeah, um, and please continue to add them if, if you've got any other questions, we can dive into that. Um, so first question, I'm the director of a CTE for Plymouth Schools. Uh, could I be invited to the COP meetings? I'm trying to learn how we may integrate skills into our programs and add courses that might help develop workers for the offshore wind industry. Absolutely. Um, so right now, I guess you could say the, the kind of regular group of community practice members are our grantees. We're very much open to having other folks who want to either learn from the group or share something they're working on come. And I think that's a great example of, first of all, something we're trying to support because CTE is, is actually um, written out as one of our focus areas. So I think that it would be very um, beneficial for you to join the group. 
we have our next meeting is it february jeremy that's virtual yeah yeah so we can probably help you out with getting a link to that one um we try to keep the in-person meetings in the in the warmer weather a lot of the folks hosting us are um academic institutions so they typically have more room for us um when school's out so that's how we fit it in if you want to send an email to lauren or i with contact information um, and mention you're interested in the community practice meetings, we can uh, certainly add you to our outreach list. Um, next mm -hmm. question, how are you evaluating cost effectiveness for track one proposals? That's a good question. Um, so in our solicitation, we do have um, information under the budget section, um, but I would say just in very general terms, you know, and if you want to submit this question, might be a good one for an official answer, but in general terms, um, we like to see connection to, um, you know, all the points that you're proposing. So if you're proposing to have to stand up a new um, training program, I don't know, for safety of crane operators, we want to make see that you've thought through all the um, the pieces of what that project will entail. So are you, um, you know, thinking about the equipment and where it will be housed for the life of your project? Are you going to have um, a need for staff capacity during the life of the project? So just really think, making sure that you've got kind of a, a well-rounded um, response, I guess you could say, um, and you're taking in all those different factors. I'd also say, um, you know, we have we do look at um, kind of where the bulk of the budget is going. If it's sort of just for one piece, I think the infrastructure track is very different because, of course, that's going toward um, something specific. But for track one, um, we kind of like to see a little bit more of a diverse diversification of the budget and um, where it's going. But I encourage you to submit that one in writing just so we can give you an official answer. Um, and I do encourage you to look at the solicitation too for, for further information. Uh, can you submit an application for multiple project types under track one, for example, a workforce study and an access to opportunity project? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the answer is yes. And I almost think you could combine them into one project. I actually don't think you need to submit separate um, proposals for something like that, if it's all under track one. Um, so you could have kind of two pieces to your project that you're working on. Say, you know, the first phase is that you're undergoing a study, and then maybe the second phase is you're implementing some of the um, recommendations that came from the study in the, in the second phase of your project. Um, so I think you could really submit that all in one and you don't need to um, break it up. Does that sound right to you, Jeremy? Yeah, unless there are two very distinct projects, it's not a continuation into a second phase. Um, yeah, yep. If there are meritorious proposals in this first round, is it possible that you will expend all the available funds? And given that track two is ARPA funding, is there any difference in the timing and complexity for contract funding upfront mm. timeline? That's a great question. So yes, yeah, it's possible that we will spend all the funds um, in the first round. And like I said, um, for track two in particular, that's kind of what we prefer to do, just because it's a little bit safer um, with the um, required timeline. So there is a difference in timing because I think we'll probably really prioritize those track two contracts. Um, it's going to make everyone feel a little bit more safe and secure if we've got that um, underway in plenty of time before we have that required deadline. Um, as far as complexity for contract funding, I don't think there's going to be too much complexity. There is um, there is an example agreement, like I said, in the solicitation for you to take a look at. So it does have some different language just based on the, um, the federal fund source. But shouldn't really be too much more complex or or extend the timeline. Like I said, I think people are on our team are really going to prioritize those and want to wrap them up quickly. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I would say, yeah, 
track two and three, there's definitely the possibility we expend the funds. I think track one, um, we will try, we'll definitely not expend all of the funds in the first round. But if there are some proposals that are on the cusp that get submitted in the first round, we'll mm -hmm. review them with the second round as well and may fund them uh, at the later um, date then. Uh, really that point. is all we had for questions. Um, I will say, I think we can treat these questions um, we'll, as written questions. We'll include them in our Q&A uh, when that gets posted live on the website. Um, but if anyone else has further questions now, please submit them uh, through the Q&A function. I know this is kind of a whirlwind of information that we threw at you. So. Um... Like Jeremy said, if you've got any other questions that pop up, you can always submit them to us by email. Um, we have a lot of information on our Offshore WindWorks website. We've got um, a whole list of all the past projects with a little summary for each one. Um, we have, yeah, a ton of information. So don't overlook that website. Um, and reach out to some of the folks on that list and see what they've worked on, what they're working on. and um, don't don't hesitate i think to to reach out to people well I'm hopefully this was <laughs> what'd you say said so i'm not seeing any more questions come in so okay. i'm gonna stop the recording yeah hopefully this was um 